Stephen Collis, attorney, author of Deep Conviction, the true stories of ordinary Americans fighting for the freedom to live their beliefs. Thank you so much for being part of Three Questions. Thank you for having me. Now, you are much more than just an attorney and author. In fact, your specialty is religious freedom. What is it that you actually do? And explain what you mean by religious freedom. So I represent, I chair the Religious Institutions and First Amendment Practice Group at a large nationwide law firm. And I'm actually transitioning into Stanford Law School where I'll be a research fellow there and research and writing on this topic. And by religious freedom, what we really mean is a world or a state of affairs where government really has no role in influencing people regarding religion. In other words, government does not prohibit people's religion in any way, and government does not promote people's religion in any way, which puts us all on an equal playing field to live our religion and to try to proselytize and teach each other and convert each other as we see fit according to the power of our doctrines. Many people would say that's exactly where we are right now anyway. Do you not agree? I think what we've seen over the last 30 years is kind of a watering down of religious freedom protections where government more and more and more is being used as a tool to inhibit people's religious beliefs and practices. And the problem we have is most people are losing sight of just how important religious freedom is and what it actually means. What is the definition of religious freedom to you? Uh, I think exactly what we just said. It's where government is not playing a role in how we live out our religious beliefs, whatever those beliefs might be, whether you're an atheist or an agnostic or the most devout religious believer. In any spectrum of religious belief, government is playing as little role as possible to influence us. That's religious freedom. You've written this book, Deep Conviction. Why did you write it? Uh, and one, for one reason, it's because I love telling stories. And I wanted to tell strong, compelling stories that would keep people on the edge of their seat. And another reason is I wanted people through those stories to be able to understand what religious freedom really is and how it affects people on a very personal level when their religious beliefs and practices are challenged. I have to tell you that this book is remarkable in that it takes a very complex issue, religious freedom and liberty, and turns it into something that really is a page turner. I mean, you had me turning the pages of this book and understanding the concepts, the complicated principles involved in religious liberty. Was this something you came by naturally, or had, did you have to work on this? I, well, the storytelling has always been something I've done naturally, but certainly it was years and years of coming to understand the principles and then being able to take those two skills and putting them together. I think it, you know, it's been a lifetime of practice, really. When we talk about religious liberty, I think most people get in their mind the idea of allowing religions to do whatever it is that religions want to do. But in fact, it is far more complex than that. In fact, it deeply affects both the religious and the irreligious. Explain how that is. Um, well, religious freedom, it certainly is not an absolute protection, right? We are protected in our beliefs up to a point, um, but, then, but then there may be compelling government interests that somehow will limit our religious freedom to a point. So, for example, if I have a religious belief, I don't know anyone who has this belief, but if I have a religious belief that once a year I need to sacrifice a 12-year-old boy to the gods, I think we'd all recognize that government has an interest in stopping that yeah, religious practice. You can't practice. do that. You can't yeah. do that, right? Yeah. Um, but there are lots of religious beliefs. We have, this country is the most uh, diverse, religiously, religiously diverse country on earth and in human history. And we live alongside each other in relative peace and it's because of religious freedom. The religious freedom protects atheists and agnostics, it pr protects Buddhists and Muslims and Hindus and Christians. I mean, just go across the entire gamut. Whatever your beliefs or non-beliefs are, you can be protected in this country, but other people are also protected from you. So an atheist would be protected from a Christian, but Christians would be protected from atheists. In other words, we wouldn't establish, for example, atheism as the state religion in the United States like they tried to do in the Soviet Union because of religious freedom protections. At the same time, atheists are protected from the government coming in and imposing views on them, which is, of course, one of the stories I tell in the book. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that governments must remain neutral when it comes to religious doctrines and favoring religions and, and, and the existence of religions. How unique is that in the world, that kind of a ruling? Uh, it's incredibly unique, both historically and even in the world today. You don't have to look very far to find countries where government is anything but neutral when it comes to religious belief. They favor and promote certain religious beliefs, including secularism over others. And uh, it often does lead to the very violence that we have been able to avoid here in the United States. 
many religious people will talk about answering to a higher law, and the higher laws are the laws of God as opposed to the laws of the state. But in fact, do, don't those two sets of laws actually sit side by side, speaking legally? Um, I guess I don't know exactly what you mean by do they sit side by side, but one thing I would say is I wouldn't say it's just religious people or people who believe, even believe in a God who have firm religious beliefs that they feel are more important to them than what the government might try to impose upon them. So even if you believe in no God whatsoever, you still don't want to be someone who's, who is forced to do things consistent with religious beliefs that you don't have, right? So even if you're someone who says, I'm not religious, I'm secular, what if the government came in though and said, unless you sign this document saying you believe in a certain religion, you can't get this job. Most people in that situation still have a higher conviction and a deep conviction that they're not going to sign that document. So it's not just what we traditionally think of as religious people here. Everybody kind of has that same set of beliefs. And the good news is in the United States, by and large, we all are protected, or at least we should be protected if the law is working the way the founders intended it to. So I guess what I mean by side by side is this. As, as you stated in the book, there was a gentleman who wanted to become a notary public, right? Or, and was asked to do that by his boss. He went to go sign the papers to do so, and in the state of Massachusetts, in Maryland, I guess it was, uh, there is a clause in the oath that he takes that says, I believe in God. Well, he was an atheist. He didn't believe in God, and he wouldn't sign the document. And that, of course, spurred this lawsuit that wound up in the U.S. Supreme Court. What I'm saying is that in his case, the laws of God were no greater than the laws of the state. And he should have had that right. And in fact, the U.S. Supreme Court, well, I'm not giving away the book here, but, but the, the Supreme Court did side with him on that very issue. What I'm saying is that rather than looking at the laws of God as elevated above those of the state, aren't they, in legal terms, actually sitting side by side? both needing consideration from all parties. Yeah, absolutely. P people's religious convictions and, and the laws that they adhere to with their religious beliefs should be treated with equal respect from the laws of the state. And that's really where we talk about when we say the government needs to be neutral and not play a role in this. No one's religious beliefs are put below anyone else's when it comes to the laws of the state and how they're treated. Based on how both parties in this wrestling match of ideas uh, treat their uh, and, and go after court rulings that will favor them, it seems as though both parties, both religious and non-religious and those uh, wanting more religious freedom and those wanting to limit it, don't realize that it really is a two-edged sword. That unless it's treated equally, either party, both parties will wind up getting hurt at some point. Yeah, there's no question. And we often refer to something, scholars in this area refer to something as the Puritan mistake. We talk about the Puritans coming here for religious freedom, and that's true. They came for religious freedom, but they really came for religious freedom only for themselves. As far as they were concerned, everybody else could just move, right? And, and so that was a mistake. We see people today making that exact same mistake. They, they talk about liberty, they want liberty, but they're struggling with the concept of liberty for all. So they're comfortable if they can get a ruling that serves them, but not the other side. And unfortunately, we see that from people on both the far political right and the far political left. And what they need to understand is exactly what you just said. A ruling against religious freedom against the political right today can be used against the political left or people whose religious beliefs are sometimes affiliated with the political left tomorrow. And vice versa, because and vice versa. The, the power switches back and forth. Absolutely, right. Tell me more about that uh, relationship, and let me, put, for, let me uh, put it in the form of this kind of a question. What is the relationship between control of government and the exercise of religious liberty absent religious liberty and freedom? Absent religious freedom, what that means is every different belief group, and I'm talking about religious beliefs here, are fighting for control of the government so they can then use the power of the government to force their beliefs on everybody else. That's exactly what has happened throughout human history and is happening in other countries today and it's what has led to all of the warfare that we have seen throughout human history related to religion. It wasn't religion that led to that warfare, it was a, it was a lack of religious freedom. It was a scenario that you just described where without religious freedom, religion, different religious groups including atheists were fighting for control of government so then they could use as a, the government as a sword against their ideological opposites. 
Religious freedom prevents that from happening. How do you get that message across? I know you wrote a book about it, and that's yeah. great, but yeah. how do you do that in, in soundbite form so that people understand that it serves both sides of this equation? Well, it's interviews, it's educating people so that they can share it with their friends, it's uh, getting on television, teaching, right? Everything we can do to really just help inform people so that they can then add that conversation bit to the, or add that topic to the conversation. Do you think that Americans really understand this issue? By and large, no, I don't think they do. And I think it's... What, what's the biggest misconception that Americans have about religious freedom and who it affects? I think today the biggest misconception people have about religious freedom is that religious freedom is simply a code word for bigotry, which is just not the case. Religious freedom protects every single person in this country. And the reason I say people don't understand it is I think we've enjoyed relative peace when it comes to religious differences now in our country since the founding. And we're taking it for granted because we haven't realized just how important this is and where that peace comes from. And if we don't understand it and preserve it, we're going to lose that peace in the long term. You state in the book in so many words, and, and this is more of my couching than it is of yours, but I think the point is the same, and that is you state in the book Deep Convictions that the degree to which religious freedom is allowed to exist is the degree to which religious violence is absent. Explain that principle. I think I would, I would flip the, the causation there. So if you have religious freedom, it's going to de decrease religious violence. When the founders were putting the country together, they were coming off of centuries of religious warfare. And I think what they realized is, is not so much that religion was causing all that warfare, but it was a lack of religious freedom. So they had to put something in place to try to prevent that in this new country they were forming. And they came up with what we call the religion clauses in the Constitution to stop that from happening. One clause limits how much government can infringe on the exercise of our religion, and the other clause, called the Establishment Clause, limits how much government can favor one religion over another. Those two clauses working together, if you think of them as pillars, support religious freedom. And that prevents religious fighting and violence. It's why we've been able to survive as a country as long as we have without massive religious warfare. Now, I will tell you, the United States has not been perfect, and during the 19th century and part of the 20th century, when the United States was not doing a good job of protecting religious freedom, we saw the very violence that we would wish to avoid as a country. Tell me about that violence. Explain what happened. Sure. Well, we certainly saw it with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There was massive oppression. There was lots of fighting and oppression against members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and there was retaliation back from various members of the Church of Jesus Christ. We also saw it heartbreakingly among Native Americans. They were oppressed, their religions were oppressed, and many of them fought back and tried to fight back. Now, the government continued to oppress them, but the bloodshed and the violence that they suffered because the government was trying to force religion on them and oppress their religion was, was just really heartbreaking and absolutely uncalled for. It was cl it's clear that the Founding Fathers knew the value of freedom of religion, and yet you look as recently as the 1950s, 1960s, the whole issue of, I mean, for heaven's sakes, the government all but wiped out the Klamath people and their religion and their culture in Oregon. Why on earth has it taken us so long to catch the vision as a nation, or at least as a, a government and legal system, of what the Founding Fathers had in mind when they were talking about religious liberty. Because for reasons I don't fully know or understand yet, it is, I think, the nature of almost all people to commit the Puritan mistake. And they don't realize they're doing it. They believe that they are right. They believe that they're doing something that, that the beliefs that they hold sincerely are correct and they therefore believe they're able to use government to force those beliefs on others. Now, I will say happily that for all the horrors the government inflicted upon the Klamath tribe, which is something I talk about in the book, the Klamath tribe today is thriving and successful and their culture is preserved, but they had to fight through a century of bloodshed and oppression to make that happen, and they shouldn't have had to, to do that. As we are recording this interview, last week, the House of Representatives in Washington passed the Equality Act, which is an amendment to the Civil Rights Act that will include LGBTQ people as a designated uh, protected uh, group from discrimination. 
Based on the arguments that you're making in your book, Deep Convictions, how does the Equality Act pass muster constitutionally? Does it pass muster? Well, I, I don't know how it's going to pass muster constitutionally if it faces li actual litigation. I think that's something that lawyers are going to debate out and it's going to face a lot of legal challenges as written. But I do think we as a society can achieve the goals of the Equality Act by providing equal rights for LGBTQ citizens. And I think that's a, an appropriate and proper thing to do and probably should have been done a long, long time ago. We can do it without sacrificing religious freedom. As it's written, the Equality Act currently, the one that passed the House, is intentionally writing out religious freedom protections. It doesn't need to do that to achieve its goals. If, if, if there is, if both reasonable people on both sides can come together and try to find compromises, you can actually achieve all the goals of the Equality Act, or I'd say the vast, vast, vast majority of the goals of the Equality Act, and still protect religious freedom. And so my hope is as that bill continues to percolate through Congress, reasonable minds on both sides will come together to achieve that. I'm not sure that that'll happen because in our society right now, both the far right and the far left are committing the Puritan mistake. And I just don't know if they're gonna be willing to set that aside, come to the table and actually find workable solutions for everybody. In 2012, there were 20 seconds in a cake shop in the Denver area that led to a huge lawsuit that has affected millions and millions of people in this country in regard to whether or not the cake shop owner had the right to decline the request to make a wedding cake for a same-sex wedding. Where are we now in that fight? And there are many people who still believe that was not the correct decision by the Supreme Court, even though it was a 72 uh, decision. Sure. Uh, do I have time to set the stage a little Absolutely. bit? Absolutely. So the, 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 the facts in that case are incredibly important. You have a cake maker who um, is happy to serve anyone who comes into his store and is happy to employ anyone who comes to work for him, including LGBT citizens. So he'll serve them anything. His religious beliefs prevent him from um, servicing certain events. So for example, he won't make a Halloween cake because according to his religious tradition, he believes Halloween celebrates the occult. He won't bake cakes to celebrate divorce, believe it or not. People actually want cakes to celebrate divorce, and he thinks that's wrong, and he won't bake a cake for that. He won't bake cakes for bachelor parties, because he thinks there's just too much debauchery going on at bachelor parties. And because of his religious beliefs, he couldn't make cakes that celebrated a same-sex wedding. That was one more category that he couldn't make. Then you have uh, David Mullins and Charlie Craig come into the store, and as you say, it was a 20-second conversation. They asked for him to bake a custom cake to celebrate his wedding, and he said, look, guys, I'll sell you anything in the store off the shelves. I can't make this particular cake. That's what led to the lawsuit. It went on for six, now seven years. He eventually won seven to two in the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, the state of Colorado decided to come after him again, even after he won in the Supreme Court, and they recently dropped their case, realizing that they weren't going to be able to get around the Supreme Court's decision. The Supreme Court, though, th the way Colorado behaved in that case was so egregious. They showed such a lack of neutrality and, a, and really a disdain for his religious beliefs that the Supreme Court said you can't do that. That doesn't resolve some of these cases that are still percolating around the country. There's not that many of them. Quite frankly, there's not that many people out there who are going to turn down good business because of their religious convictions. There's a small group, and that group of people, uh, those cases are still percolating. Courts are coming out in varied ways, and I suspect that what's going to happen is it's eventually end up, going to end up back in the Supreme Court again, and the justices are going to have to make a decision. I don't know what that decision will be. It will be probably tied very closely to the facts of the particular case that get to them, though. And it's impossible to know what those variations and versions might be at this point. Right. right, right. And I'll emphasize, the reason I went through the lengthy discussion of those facts is they really matter. There's no case that I'm aware of, and I don't think any case will ever exist, where a couple could come into a cake shop, let's say a gay couple comes in holding hands, and the, and the shop owner says, I don't serve gay people, get out. I don't think there is any scenario under the sun where a shop owner in that scenario would win that case. And I don't think there's ever been a court that's ever held that. So that type of case, if it were litigated, the cake shop owner would lose. Other cases that are more similar to what happened in Colorado, I think the cake shop owner will win every time. And so there's going to be a variation of fact patterns in between there. And I don't know exactly how the justices are going to try to resolve it. But the important thing is that the cake shop owner and others get the chance to at least make the arguments. And 
and try to at least explain what their religious convictions are and why they're doing what they're doing. And it's important for the LGBT couple to also have protections so that everybody is getting a chance to have their day in court, if that makes sense. The way Colorado treated uh, Jack Phillips, who was the cake owner there that had the issue with the uh, same-sex wedding cake, the way the state of Colorado treated him was, as you said, egregious in terms of uh, favoring one thought pattern over another. Uh, and and it, it was stunning to see the way they treated him. Is that becoming more common now from state to state and situation to situation? Or was Colorado unique? No, I think, I think that's actually common in many states today. Now, most states, especially after the Masterpiece Cake Shop ruling from the Supreme Court, uh, are going to back off of being so obvious about their hostility towards the religious beliefs of people like Jack Phillips. But I'll emphasize, it wasn't just, it's not just my opinion that Colorado behaved egregiously there. Seven of the nine justices on the Supreme Court, including Justices Kagan and Breyer, felt like Colorado's behavior was egregious, right? They compared him to Nazis and slaveholders, called his religious beliefs despicable. And what the justice, what seven of the nine justices said is you can't do that under current First Amendment law. You simply cannot have that hostility towards someone's religious beliefs. You've got to give these people a fair hearing. What I think is going to happen going forward, that hostility is still going to be there in some states, but the states aren't going to be nearly as obvious about the hostility. They'll be much smarter about not making public comments that are going to draw the ire of the justices down the road. There is a chasm now that has developed between the LGBT left, as you term it, and the religious right. Where did that ch chasm start, and how do we close it again? Well, I mean, in all honesty, neither side likes my answer here, so I, and, I'm, and I'm comfortable with that. The reality is that chasm, I think, started many, many decades ago when the religious right, quite frankly, was unkind and hostile and downright uh, egregious towards the LGBT community. And that's where they had to live in the closet, they had to be secret, there were laws criminalizing their relationships and their behavior, and they really had to live in hiding, which is a horrible way to live, right? Then, as society changed and the pendulum swung, you essentially saw the LGBT side seeking equality under the law. The problem is that at least some segment of the political left, I'm not going to say it's the LGBT side because I don't, it's not entirely the LGBT community. Some extreme element of the political left is wanting to go past equality and start oppressing folks on the religious right and forcing their views on the religious right. So it started with the religious right forcing all of their views, views on the LGBT community. And now you've got people on the far left wanting to force their views on the religious right. Both sides made mistakes. It was a mistake to start where we did and it's a mistake to end where the religious right are being punished or forced to do things that they don't want to do. What we truly need is what people are, at least on, a, on their face, calling for, and that's equality under the law. We can get there, but it's going to require both sides to stop trying to get a total victory against the other side. I think what you're talking about is compromise, and the truth of the matter is, is that compromise has become a dirty word anymore in political circles. You just don't compromise. How do we change that up? How do we get back to the point where we compromise with each other and not dig our heels in and meet people in the middle? Yeah, get off social media. <laughs> no, I, I mean, in some part, I mean that seriously. I think people are in echo chambers and they're not listening to what other people have to say. But I was just uh, being interviewed by the University of Washington Law School uh, a couple days ago. And they asked me, what advice would you give to young lawyers or law students who want to get into this area? And my first answer was, come into it with an open mind. Don't come into it as an advocate for one side or the other, but come in and try to understand all sides' arguments. Understand where people are coming from, what their struggles are, what their beliefs are from both sides, and then, then try to tackle the problem. We're dealing with two historic wrongs here that humanity has repeated again and again and again. One wrong is discrimination that we're trying to stop. The other wrong is preventing people from having the professions of their choice based on their religious beliefs. And humanity, historically, when oppressing other people whose religious beliefs they disagree with, that's one of the first things they do. We're trying to stop both of those wrongs. That's the problem as a society we're trying to solve. If you only listen to people that your knee-jerk reaction is to agree with, we're never going to get there. What we need to do is listen to the arguments, the harms, the heartbreak on both sides, and then ask ourselves, how can we come to a solution? I do believe it's possible. I believe there are people out there working very hard on it. 
we just have to continue to push for it. Does the U.S. Constitution protect religious dissenters from laws driven by the majority in power at this point? At this point, it does to some degree, but the protection is not nearly as robust as it has been at times in our past. How do you fix that? Well, that, it's interesting. So there was a case in 1990, I write about it in the book, where it used to be the, or the, uh, the, the religion clauses of the First Amendment protected religious dissenters from laws passed by the majority, subject to the government having a compelling interest, right? In 1990, the Supreme Court changed that. And they changed it to say if a law is neutral and generally applicable, that is, if it applies to everybody and doesn't target a specific religion, then we don't care if a law burdens someone's religious exercise. There was a statute passed in 1993 to try to fix the problem called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Right. That statute is now under fire. And one of the issues with the current draft of the Equality Act is it's trying to undermine and take away parts of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. The reason it's called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is because Congress intended it to do what it says, to restore the religious freedom that the Supreme Court had taken away. And it's fascinating, people are surprised to hear this, but the opinion that took away that religious freedom protection was written by Justice Scalia, of all people. Um, the and it was quite shocking at the time, too. It was shocking to everybody at the time. And it has basically put the protections for religious freedom ever since in a state of constant flux. Nobody knows really what protections are in place depending on where you are in the country. It changes where you move. Um, the question now is, will the Religious Freedom Restoration Act stay in place? Will the Supreme Court come and overrule the Smith decision and put the protections in place that were there before the Smith decision? Or will we as a society come to some agreement on these issues so that we can both protect religious minorities and protect folks like folks in the LGBT community and other government interests that we have. I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know what the solution is going to be. Um, I'm hopeful that as a society we can figure it out. But I do worry about what you said, about how polarized we are right now. You treat in great detail uh, in the book the decision that uh, Justice Scalia uh, issued in the Al Smith case. And that being uh, allowing Al Smith as a Klamath Indian or Klamath Native American to use peyote in his religious uh, services. When uh, Justice Scalia said, no, that is not what we're talking about here and you can't do that. And the neutrality and, uh, and uh, general applicability of this law comes into question. You've poured through all the documents. What on earth was he thinking? I think what was going on there is the conservative wing of the U.S. Supreme Court was pushing back on the expansion of constitutional rights that had been happening really since about the 1950s and up until about 1990. In the Smith decision, the conservatives finally had a majority on the court, and they wanted to give states more power to regulate. So what Justice Scalia did in that opinion was essentially said, there's not a constitutional right here. States, you go back and you can regulate this how you want to. Now the problem with that, of course, is that there was a constitutional right and that's why people were so upset by the decision. But I think that's what's going on. I think religious freedom got caught up in a broader pushback to give states more rights to control the law and regulate. In the book, you use four major cases to outline how religious freedom has evolved in this country. The U.S. Supreme Court seems to have corrected each problem in the lower courts where religious freedom was not granted and not allowed. Can we trust the U.S. Supreme Court to continue to do that? I think we can trust them to some degree, but look, it's nine people, they're not perfect and they're going to make mistakes. And I think it's a real mistake to try to throw onto those nine people all of the resolutions of our society's problems. When you watched, if you listened to the oral argument in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, the one thing that stood out to me was Justice Breyer expressing exasperation that the two sides simply couldn't come to some type of solution here. He sounded like a father dealing with two children 
or a mother dealing with two children, either way, a parent dealing with two children and the, and the children keep fighting and fighting and fighting and keep coming to the parents to resolve the dispute. And he repeatedly asked, couldn't you have reached some kind of compromise? Couldn't you have figured this out? You could almost feel his frustration. I don't think it's fair to ask this, these nine men and women to solve all of our problems. We as a society can do this and we can do it legislatively long before it gets there. We can pass laws to protect our interests while exempting out the few people who have religious objections to those laws. That has been the pattern from the beginning of time. You have a law that generally applies to everybody. You've got a small religious group or even a bigger religious group who has an objection to that law because of their religious beliefs. You give them the protection they need and society continues to function. A very early example involved the Quakers. The Quakers uh, didn't believe, they believed in pacifism and they couldn't fight in war. When the founding of the nation happened, uh, we had a law that said every able-bodied young man needed to join up in the military and protect our new country. And the Quakers wrote to George Washington and they say, we can't do that and we really hope you can protect us. So you've got this general rule, you got one religious group saying we need some protection. And George Washington wrote back and said, yes, we'll give you the protection. And the Quakers were able to contribute to the country in a different way. We can do that again and again and again without constantly throwing it into the justices' laps and hoping that they'll save us. I, I think the late Rodney King probably put it best when he coined the question, can't we all just get along? Right, right. That truly is the sentiment, I think, that uh, is needed at this point, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. So how do we get to that point? How do we stop fighting each other, filing brief after brief after brief after brief and suit after suit after suit? It's over 20 seconds right. in it's, a cake shop. It's time to listen and stop talking, and I think it's also time to live and let live, which has been a grand American tradition that I think we're in danger of losing. Well, the, the book is Deep Conviction, True Stories of Ordinary Americans Fighting for the Freedom to Live Their Beliefs. The author is Stephen T. Collis. Thank you so much for being Thanks part for of Three me. Questions. Appreciate it.